Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Viola Rollins, and I am the executive director of the London Business School Leadership Institute. Um, and I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you to this very, very special event, uh, Sir Alex Ferguson and Paul McGinley in conversation with Professor Randall Peterson. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Professor Randall Peterson. All right. Thank you, Violet. Uh, I want to kick us off here by just acknowledging that, the, that you two have both been here to London Business School before, um, but actually there's a much longer history uh, of you guys both working with each other. And why don't we just start, for the benefit of everybody here, how the two of you met and what, uh, and what the nature of that relationship has been over time. Well, yeah, we, we met about 20 years ago in a pro-am in Ireland um, where I was drawn uh, to play with Sir Alex and we had, a, we had a really good time together, 36 holes and uh, dinner that night. Um, and then uh, obviously we went back to our own careers. You were busy winning European Cups and Premier Leagues and uh, I, I was a professional golfer at the time, went on to, uh, to play uh, obviously Ryder Cups. And, and when I evolved into being the Ryder Cup captain, um, I sat down and uh, looked at not just what was in front of me, but also myself, um, where I felt I was strong, where I felt I was weak, um, what challenges I was going to be facing as captain, um, and how I was going to uh, conquer those challenges, and, and um, what kind of help I might need along the way. Obviously, a vice captain is a very important part of, uh, of, of my structure, and I I was thinking carefully along those, and, and also I needed a couple of people in terms of sounding boards. Um, but, but when I looked at the challenges, the things that jumped out for me, um, there was three things in particular. Um, one was that the identity that I wanted the team to play, to play on. Um, I, I'm a great believer in uh, if you're having fun doing something, you're probably going to do it well. And I wanted us to play, uh, to, to be a, a team who were going to have a lot of fun taking on a challenge we were going to do. And, as much as I'm not a Man United fan, I'm a West Ham fan, uh, I always enjoyed watching Man United play. I'm not, I can't say that about all, every other team, but I did certainly enjoy watching Man United. If they were on TV, I would watch them, particularly when they were playing at home. And I loved uh, the, the way they played in the front foot, this wave after wave of attack. They always had a go. And I, I coined it as a, as a kind of a, I played with a smile on their face. So, you know, they were a fun team to watch. So that was the first identity I wanted to have. As a t wanted to have. And um, the second one, uh, was that I was going up against a formidable captain in Tom Watson whose playing career was way up there compared to mine in terms of major championships won and, and stature in the game um, and how I was going to deal with that particularly in the media in the two year run up to the Ryder Cup captaincy and then the third thing was um, I played three Ryder Cups I was always from number 6 to 12 on the team um, so I had empathy with those guys on the team um, from 1 to 6 though uh, I didn't really have the same empathy because I never was one of those soldiers, never was one of those players. And um, how do you manage a Rory McIlroy or a Justin Rose, these superstars of the game, or a Henrik Stenson, Sergio Garcia? Um, so putting those three big challenges together, um, I came up with the idea that I'd recontact Sir Alex and uh, and see if he would help me. So um, he invited me up to uh, Manchester, and we went up and we had lunch. You were unemployed at the time. You'd just come out of employment. Uh, so we had... Pensioner. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we had a nice lunch, um, very nice lunch. Uh, I got the train up, so I was able to enjoy his lovely bottle of red wine. Um, and, and that's where it started. And that's where our conversation started. That was probably a year, just over a year in advance uh, of the Ryder Cup 2014. Well, it was actually a year before the, the competition, which impressed me quite a lot. And after listening to Paul about his plans and even talking about who his opening two players are going to be, I thought, this is something I really enjoy. Someone who's organised like this has got the drive, ambition to do really well. And I agreed to be part of it. And my job really was to... Because one of the key things in when you're successful or when you're in a big competition happens all the time is complacency and it was by real sheer coincidence that I mentioned Medina when on Saturday night the USA are 
They're sitting there having dinner, a great position. The only thing that Europe could do was win the first game and see where it took them. And from there, they win the first game. Bit of confusion, possibly. They win the next game, panic. And after that was capitulation. Because the complacency had come right into them. And I spoke about that, and by a sheer coincidence, on Saturday night, the Ryder Cup and Glen Eagles, you were winning 10-6. Mm -hmm. So it was a great opportunity. And there was some examples about, about um, complacency, and it affects us all, all of us. It's a disease. You cannot get out of it. Once it's there, you cannot get out of it. It's like we always say that half time you're winning 2-0. It's a dangerous scoreline. Because you lose a goal, it's a different game. So always about complacency at half time. Keep to the same routine as we're doing. Go for the throw. Don't give an inch away, etc., etc. I don't know if anyone remember the first medals. It was actually at the game. Uh, Azarenka against Williams. She beats her serve. Uh, beats um, uh, uh, Williams' serve to go 5-3 up in the final set. She's going for her serve to win the game. She turns to her box, she goes, yes. Mm -hmm. Williams looked at her. The only thing Williams could do was win the next point, and the next point, and the next point, and win it. Can you imagine what Azarenka was thinking that night in bed? But she had her head under the pillow. Home, she would never wake up. That is, that happens. Complacency happens, and it's, that was one of the, the messages we're getting across to the players. Go for the throw at all times. And if you lose a hole, win the next hole. That's all you can do, particularly in an individual sport, uh, like tennis or, or boxing or, or golf, win the next hole, win the next point, mm -hmm. win the next game. So that was the kind of message I wanted to get across to the players because in my, all my time at United or any job I ever had, always worried about complacency. Always worried about it. It was the main theme with driving home about this complacency. And the other thing we spoke about was um, <laughs> a story about the geese. And uh, I had a, a friend of mine, his cousin's a farmer in Canada. <clears throat> he was sitting having lunch today, he says, yeah, I was over with my cousin staying there. And he says, it's amazing, you know, he says, you know the geese leave every late October flying 4,000 miles to get sun. And I thought, that's a great story, that. So they find two Vs, right? The ones in the second V go in the slipstream of the ones at front. If one takes ill, two go away and look after it. Now, that is fantastic teamwork. So we won the league one year. My opening speech to the players the first day of the season was the story of the geese. And I went to, um, to Barthez, our French goalkeeper, who is quite a relaxed guy about life. And I says, um, and, I, and I made a mistake about saying the French word for geese was here in Delm, which is not, as it turned out when... Victor. Uh, yeah, Peter told Victor us. Victor de Buisson, yeah. Yeah, de Buisson. Um, I says, here on Dell, I'm going to tell a story about here in Dell. And he goes, what? <laughs> now, don't be, because it's bad that I'm saying, he always really understands it anyway. <laughs> I carried on. I said, no, these, and I told the story about the geese. I said, all I'm asking you, these bloody geese fly 4,000 miles for a bit of sun. All I'm asking you to do is to play 38 games in one week. <laughs> That's not too much, is it? <laughs> so that was, uh, and anyway, on the final day when we win the Ryder Cup, the team are getting a photograph taken. And what flies over them? Geese. Mm. And they're all pointing to the geese. There was a photograph taken and, uh, and yeah, we, we, we were all pointing up and uh, we did a painting of it and yeah, presented fantastic. it to all the players and the caddies and, and to you Go as well. On, yeah. So yeah. Re really the, the, the points was that uh, the, the big thing I learned from our, from our lunches and, and discussions over, over the year uh, prior to the Ryder Cup was, was this importance of continuity. Um, the continuity of message, that the same message was getting repeated to the players. Um, complacency was an important um, subject because we'd won the last two Ryder Cups. Um, we'd won seven out of nine. Um, and complacency was something that I was worried about as captain. We were a little bit too happy with ourselves. We'd, we, you know, I didn't want, I wanted us to be on edge. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted us to have as a team that freshness. 
um, that anticipation, that nerves, um, uh, or those nerves. And that's why complacency was, was an important, important part. And then we also talked then about in the modern, the modern day in terms of players playing five matches. Um, yeah, and, yeah. and, you know, how tough it is to play five matches um, yeah. in, in two and a half days. Um, hence the importance of the geese. And that's where that story came along and he told a story about shared responsibility. So, you know, there was continuity in everything that we did. And then you take all what we talked about and that's when I then transferred them into the images that we saw in the team room. And those images illustrated each of these points. Um, with the complacency one turned into a huge big image uh, of, of a rock in a raging storm underneath. We will be the rock when the storm comes. And that was... That was come out of the out of the complacency conversation, along with what happened to the American team in Medina, and then as 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 Alex says, we were four points ahead going into the singles, and uh, I got a text message from him that night. One word: complacency. I knew exactly what he meant. <laughs> right. So, share a few thoughts or a few examples of specific things you've done and said, working with your respective teams, to when you when you feel complacency uh, might be a concern. Well, the, the amount of times of stress that I didn't expect it. And I think that when the, the one guy was at United, the expectation was strong. I didn't expect him to let me down in that respect. But there may have been odd occasion, but we never lost the message about that. Never lost the message. Uh, it was always mentioned. Every team talk we always mentioned, I would do. At the end of my team talk, it was always about complacency, work ethic and concentration. And concentration mm -hmm. equally is the same as complacency. These are vital components of being successful. You know, use your concentration. I, 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 I did this daft thing. I bought 24 chess sets. I said, I'm going to teach them to play chess. I bottled it. I did, I bottled it. Yeah. Uh, they think, I'm saying they think it's a gimmick. I'm sure they, they might think it's a gimmick. They might say, what the hell is he doing now? And they're still lying there in, in Carrington, I think, these chess yeah. sets. <laughs> but no, what really see is about, about chess is anyone who's played it, you do need to concentrate. I mean, it's a long concentration too. Whereas a football concentration could be a fleet in seconds. Mm -hmm. You know, you just drop your concentration, a corner kick or a free kick or a pass in the ball and you're dead. You know, and so... Mm -hmm. But anyway, I thought it was a, it would have been a good thing to try, you know, but it didn't, it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my um, I, I got two stories on, on the complacency theme, and one of them was when I was a player in 2004. Bernard Langer was the captain, who I learned a lot from as a captain, uh, Germanic, and he approached it in a very structured, organised way, his captaincy. Wasn't the emotional captain that Sam Torrance was, who I played under two years previously. Um, and... Um, Bernard Langer is a guy I've never, ever, ever, even to this day, heard curse. He never uses a swear word. And um, we were four points ahead going into the singles. And we were all in this big boardroom where we're having our team meeting on a Saturday night. And we were very happy with ourselves as a team. We were sitting down. A couple of guys were having a, a little beer. Some guys were having coke. Everybody was chatter, chatter, chatter. And Bernard Langer always stayed outside the room until 7 o'clock. And at 7 o'clock, he'd come in. Even though everybody might have been in at 5 to 7, he wouldn't come in until 7. Um, and at seven o'clock he comes in and we're all very happy and things go quiet and we're waiting for him to get the, the meeting where he sits at the top of the table on the way and we're all quite happy with ourselves and we're ready for the, we're ready for the uh, well done lads. What a terrific performance away from home. We're four points ahead, away, away from victory here. Uh, or sorry, we're four point lead and we're on the thresholds of victory. We've done wonderfully well. Tom tomorrow it's all about concentrating and well done. Everybody's been great and we're ready for this kind of, um, this kind of a chat from the captain. And uh, as he sat down, it went silent and he lifted up his fist like this and he slammed it as hard as he could into the desk. And everybody kind of shook, first of all, this is Bernard Langer to do this, something like this was unheard of. And he said, and I won't use the word, I, to, tomorrow I want the effing record. Not just win, obliterate them. Um, and all of a sudden the whole vibe in the room changed from, whoa, we still have a lot of work to do. And that, that very much brought home um, a, a re-channeling of our energies. Um, so that was the first story um, on, on complacency. Um, the second one was um, 
based on our conversations and, and, and the importance of it and what happened to the American team in Medina in 2012 and the next edition uh, was in 14. Um, going into the team meeting on a Saturday night, as Sir Alex said, we were four points ahead. Uh, and I had ideas what I wanted to say to the team based around complacency, which I did. But I wanted the meeting to be short and short and uh, very precise in getting the messages across. So what I asked at the last meeting was for our most experienced player in the room, including the vice captains, uh, Lee Westwood, um, to speak and address the players himself. Um, we had a little podium like this and I wanted to address it. So I gave him good advance notice and I said, look, Lee, I want, I want you to say something on complacency. We're four points ahead. Um, this is what I'm going to say, and I want you to come in on the back of that. So he did, and he spoke for maybe three minutes. Um, and he spoke very clearly, very precisely. And his point was, there's been four sessions so far in this Ryder Cup. We might be four points ahead, but we've only won two sessions out of the four. America have also won two. We need to win the single session tomorrow. And then we win 3-2 as well as a victory in the Ryder Cup. So again, that turned everybody's focus into the, what was ahead of us uh, and, and refocused us and re-energized us in. So th there are the two stories on complacency, but to be complacent, you got to get into, into a good position in the first place, and that's a whole different story. <laughs> right, and that's a story I want to follow up on now. <laughs> um, both of you have been willing to make some sometimes controversial changes. Um, I think particularly you, Sir Alex, has made some changes that were not necessarily popular with the fans in the immediate term um, at times, and you've had to, but talk a little bit about some of the reasons for making those changes. Um, I think we, we had a short conversation before this talking mm -hmm. about, you know, kind of the forward planning and, and thinking behind some of the things that may not be popular in the moment, but actually have a, a longer term uh, payoff. Well, uh, longevity well, helped me. Um, when I came to United, of course, the first thing I did was trust in my own conviction about developing a football club rather than a football team. It's understandable in modern day football that a coach concentrates on his team because that keeps him in a job. I never worried about that. I always believed that to build a football club was the most important thing to do, particularly through young people, because I've always believed in young people. I did it at St. Bernard, I did it at Aberdeen, <coughs> so I wasn't going to change that. And through that, we developed a fantastic football club where I could work three, four years ahead to where my team was going to be. Either be the young players coming through or the profile of players we're looking at who could replace all the players in the team. <coughs> it's a difficult thing to do when you're, when you're discussing the older players because uh, a period, um, say for instance, with three defenders getting older at the same time, like um, Bruce Pallister and Dennis Irwin, and they were family, really, because I've had them for, well, Dennis for 11 years, Derek, Gary Powers and Steve Bruce for 9, 10 years. Um, and they, like any football playing at Manchester United, they want to play till they're 90. <laughs> but it doesn't happen. They don't realise that they're going back the way, you know, the age catches up with them. My job is manager of Manchester United. I'm not their father, I'm not their brother. And it's, people say I'm ruthless. I'm not ruthless. I'm doing my job for Manchester United. That's what I was paid to do. So I have to make sure that I've got the profile of a player who can replace that, you know, either through the young players, which we had Wes Brown, who, in my mind, would have been one of our best ever players, but for the injuries he had, a fantastic defender. And he made his debut 18 against Swedes United, which is not an easy job, an easy game. But nonetheless, uh, that long everyday gave me that opportunity to work three, four years ahead what I, what I felt my team could be. And um, I had a conference to do that. Uh, and all, all my teams throughout my time at United were averaging between 26 and a half and 27 and a half. Always. Mm. So I always made sure my, my ages were correct in terms of young players, middle 20s, and ones just over 30. And that never changed. That was consistent with that. And it worked, because I knew we were going through that. So that um, it wasn't a problem for me to do that, because, as I say, that we built a structure which we, we were confident in. Mm. Yeah, and to what extent do you say, look, this is how we're, this is what we are, 
uh, as a club. And so I'm going to look for players that fit that versus build around specific players. Well, the profile thing is a bit more difficult, of course. Um, up until the, the academy system changed at, at, um, in England, we were the best at, at uh, coaching and scouting in England. The change that we meant that we couldn't take a, a player, a young player, with, from outside an hour from Old Trafford, which changed the dy dynamics of a football club greatly, which meant we then had to scout abroad greatly because our, our European players were namely Northern Hemisphere players. Danish, Scandinavian, Norwegian, Sweden. Great, their medical um, records, our tests were fantastic. Hardly any blemishes in their joints. Speak English, good healthy upbringing, outdoor. Uh, and that, 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 that was very successful for us. But when the, the, the dynamics of the club changed through the academy system, we then had to start going into France, Spain, South America. And to be honest with you, it was fantastic. And what I did then, I brought in a coach who could speak languages, Carlos Queros, because I can't speak five languages. I can speak Scottish. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I can speak a little French and a little bit German, as just small bits, but it's important to understand how you deal with other cultures. It was a fantastic period for us, really brilliant. And my last, in one year with 21 nationalities, in my final count at United, I think it was something like 38, 37 nationalities. Mm. So I knew to structure that was really important in terms of make sure they've got a driving licence, their, uh, their school's education, the kids' education, uh, language te teachers, getting their bank details. Oh, But we had a good, we had a good uh, process for that, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, no, that was, a, it was really important that um, we had a, a good structure of a football club could deal with all the things that we were doing as, as progress went along. Mm. And, of course, both of you have managed the you know, very multinational teams um, in the end. Um, and what are your insights in managing multinational team? Yeah, I mean, it, it, that's a, it, it's, it's complex. You know, bringing individuals together, particularly from an individual sport like golf is, uh, bringing 12 um, people who are brought up um, from the age of 12 or 13, not, normally they're, they're very good at a very young age and, and, and thought and trained um, in a very selfish sport like golf is. Uh, it's an individual sport. And they're trained with that mindset. Um, I was, um, I, I, I took the view, unlike, and this is where we'll, where we'll differ, um, you know, whereas, whereas Alex would have had his players and coached them and could harness them into the, into the Man United way and mould them over time into how he wanted the team to play and who he wanted them um, to play with and, and what, what structure he wanted to put around the team and how he could get, get them integrated into the team. Um, I didn't, I'd one shot at it uh, over a two year period um, where there was only going to, the first time they'd all be 12 together in the same room at the same time would be the Monday of the Ryder Cup. So I didn't have any, any opportunity to get them together beforehand. Um, so I very much took the view that they were individuals coming together to play in a team. And the best way of getting the most out of them was to let them stay as individuals. Um, there's only so much team bonding you can do in a week. Um, and I didn't try to do something that I knew was not going to be feasible that I've seen previous captains try to do in the past. Um, so we had a huge big, uh, a big quote uh, as you walked into our team room. Um, and I said, the best teamwork comes from those individuals uh, working independently toward, towards one goal in unison. Now, I know that's contrary to a lot of the talk you'll hear about teams, um, but for me, it was very applicable to the Ryder Cup because it's an individual sport. Mm -hmm. And there's only so much that I can do and achieve. So what I tried to do um, was, I mean, let's just take one example. I mean, you can go through all the players, but the one example would be, would be Victor de Buisson, who was a rookie from France. And the best way to describe him is if he's left field, he's way left of there. Um, Victor... Uh, and, and, uh, and Graham McDowell. And I had this idea that Victor needed a strong guy on his shoulder. I'd seen Graham McDowell play that role with Rory McIlroy when Rory came on tour first. Um, I thought that had moved uh, away. They weren't going to be playing together. And I wanted um, Graham to play that senior role with 
um, with Victor. So rather than converse it with them, I wanted to try it out. So I spoke to the European Tour in advance of the Ryder Cup, and as a result, I got them to play together when they were playing European Tour events without them knowing that I was actually trying to get them bonded. And, I, and if there was any issues, I was going to find out. So, um, you know, I'd run into them later in the week. Oh, who'd you play with this week, Graham? Oh, I played with uh, Victor. Yeah, how, how's his game? And you know, that's where I was gathering information. But all the time, and then he would come to the next tournament and then he was paired with him again, but he still didn't cop on what was going on. <laughs> um, and I was doing something similar with Jamie Donaldson and, and Lee Westwood and Rory and Sergio. So, and, you know, all of a sudden, this is how I was. And if there was, there was some things where it didn't kick off, I said, like, okay, that's fine. So I'll make sure to keep him over there and him over there. So th that's how I managed the situation without actively getting them on a day-to-day -day basis like you would have had at Man United. I just want to add to one thing about... Um, <clears throat> integration of players coming in different nationalities, the best place is the sanctuary of the training ground because no one could get into United's training ground. The press called it cold, it's that's what they called it. Nobody can, it's peaceful. The players can then settle and get to know each other, train sessions and, you know, that it was the most beautiful place in the world was the training ground, honestly. Your peace, being able to work with players who want to work their intensity, their concentration, fantastic. And that, there's just a one story about language with, with English people, or British people are very poor at, in general. Um, we, some of our players that came could speak languages, some three, four languages, but we had one player from Uruguay, uh, Diego Forwan, who could speak five languages. His last club, he signed for a Japanese club, went to the press conference and spoke in Japanese. Can you believe that? <laughs> Fantastic, isn't it? We don't have, I don't know what it is, we don't have the capacity to want to learn languages because we expect everyone can speak English. And that was a little problem with our players that um, none of them could converse with the French players, the Spanish players. They need an interpreter, if someone call them over, what is he saying? <laughs> but at the beginning that was true, but the, the training ground brought all that together. Mm. Fantastic thing. Shared activity of doing that. And really, yeah. Yeah. Really good. Just going back onto the training ground, I mean, I, I, you know, we didn't have a training ground. Um, I just had conversations in, in, in the time leading into, uh, into the Ryder Cup. So, so my plan, my organisation was, um, and my structure was formed um, on one-to-one -one with each player. So my goal, my complete goal was to have uh, every player having complete clarity of what role he had to play in the team and what his function in the team is, right down to how many matches he was playing. This is well in advance. Mm -hmm. And who his potential partners would, would be with. Um, and painted the scene of what would be like when he, when he got to Glen Eagles. Um, they'd all played the golf course uh, previously. Um, and I gave them all a file about four or five weeks out beforehand and talked about the course setup and the rough and the green speeds. Um, and... Uh, which I had control over as home captain. Um, photographs of what the inside of their, of their rooms would look like, of their, of their bedrooms, just so they could get a real, uh, their head around what, what, they, were, what they were going to uh, face. All the uniforms, they were tried on well in advance, um, a couple of times, three times, so that we didn't have this last minute tailoring that I'd seen in previous Ryder Cups of everybody coming in with trousers, in my case, normally trousers that are too long, <laughs> uh, having to be turned up. Um, I, I wanted all that done, so when we got there, we hit the ground running and, and to get straight into, uh, right, this is who you're going to be playing in your practice rounds with, but this the first day, this the second day, nine holes the third day, um, what's going to happen in the evening time. So they, they, well in advance, they weren't finding it out. Their mental energy when we got to Glen Eagles was all about getting prepared for Friday morning and hitting the first shot. So clarity and continuity of message um, were, were something I, I learned a lot and we conversed a lot about uh, prior mm -hmm. to, so that uh, there was, as I say, real clarity. When there's clarity, when guys, particularly people like, like professional sports people who are normally very structured and organised, particularly... Uh, in, in a, as I say, a selfish game like golf is. They like to be organised and structured. They don't like something ha happening at the 11th hour. So um, I, I tried to give them that kind of structure so they could hit the ground running and, mm. and focus on the golf. Okay, great. Um, I wanted to ask a question also about the relationship between technical skill, skill as player, versus leadership, uh, and the leadership you need on the field with the captain, etc. How do you, are they... How, do they come together? Do they not come together? Is it, um, what is the relationship between those? Um, well, <clears throat> my early experience of being uh, having a captain in the field, 
Um, unfortunately, only lasted two or three years with Brian Robson because he was a perfect captain. He was a fantastic leader. Players loved him, committed, and could make decisions on the pitch, you know, without having to look across to me. And he was a rarity. And at that time, I think captains were of a, a longer spell as his captain. But you know, when the game changed and European Championship came into it, and you're playing more games, the captaincy became, um, it seemed to be passed along a bit. This player wasn't available one week, this player wasn't available another week. So the captaincy was shared by a few players. You know, it's a, in the last spell with Vidic, Evra <coughs> and Giggs, the three of them were sharing it. Because Vida had injuries, Evra would replace him when Vida, Vida wasn't available. And if these two weren't available, Giggs, whereas Brian Robson's time, he was a captain for a long time. You know, so as, as it is, I don't think it's got the same importance that it had when Brian Robson was a captain. I don't. Mm. Well, when it came to the Ryder Cup, I mean, my view was, was very simply, um, in terms of technical advice, absolutely zero. Um, I'm not going to tell Rory McIlroy that he should hit a five iron rather than a six iron <laughs> or that it's a left lip putt rather than a right lip putt. He's the number one player in the world and who am I to tell him what to do? I didn't see my job as that. Um, my job was to put structure on the team, to energise the team um, and to have strong strategies that, that give us the best chance of making that Ryder Cup. And the players and the team around them, I wanted to preserve, like I said earlier, I wanted to preserve um, that selfish mindset that they have on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis as professional golfers in a, in, a, in, a, in a singular sport like golf is and preserve that mindset and bring it on to Friday morning with that mindset. So I told, um, we, we brought along all the coaches. They had opportunity to bring their coaches. They had an opportunity to bring their physios. Um, and I wanted to um, empower them to, tr- to, to arrive on a Friday morning as mentally prepared as they would be for a major championship. Um, and it was important that when they went into this team, um, th- this team philosophy that we were going to have on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, that they, they didn't sanitize them, that they didn't lose that edge that they have individually because they're not trained. They're not trained for this. They're trained for here, mm-hmm. but they're not trained for this. And on Friday morning, I wanted them where they were here. So I had to be very careful with that team dynamic Then I didn't sanitize them and soften them and take the edges off. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I had to be um, very careful with that, uh, converse with them with that, um, and also converse with their team behind the scenes to make sure that they didn't let them go too far. And it just shows you how important the team is. Um, One decision that I made, and and it wasn't in the plan, but one decision that I'd made uh, was not down to me or the vice captains, it was down to the the backroom team of of Henrik Stenson. Henrik Stenson was warming up on a Saturday morning, getting ready to play. He'd won his two matches with Justin Rose at the number one game the day before. They were flying, they were playing in the morning. I forget who now they were playing. I think they were playing Mac Cooch, I, I forget now anyway. I'll, I'll say it wrong if I, if I try to remember. But he was getting ready. It was 7.15 in the morning. He's 45 minutes before his tea time. And uh, I had empowered the caddies. Um, I had meetings with the caddies every night. And my view simply was, as much as I might know um, about Rory McIlroy's game, for example, I don't know anywhere near him as well as his okay. caddy does. So I wanted to preserve that, that partnership. And I didn't want to poke into that partnership. It was important. That was a very powerful partnership that had won two major championships that year. And I wanted them there on the first tee that way. And it wasn't for me to start poking at that. Um, having said that, I told the caddies that I was always there. If they had any information that they wanted to give to me or share with me, I was there. But that I would never intrude on that dynamic. And I wanted to preserve that dynamic. Sure enough, 7.15 on a Saturday morning, um, Garrett Lord, who caddies for Henrik, who's been caddying for quite a while, uh, throws the eyes at me this way, um, which means I want to have a chat, but out of earshot of Henrik. Um, so I kind of moved away to the side and around the corner where the crowd were, and uh, he followed me over. And he said, look, he says, I'm really worried about Henrik this morning. Um, he's tight. He's not warming up properly. Um, he's not hitting the ball well. He's got a tight back now for the last three or four months, and I'm worried that he won't be able to do 36 again today, having done 36 yesterday. I said, okay, thanks, Lordy, that's all you need to say, leave that with me. So then I went away and uh, I quietly um, gave the eyes to the coach, that I, Pete Cowan, I wanted to have a word of him. And he slipped away and I said, how are we doing this morning? How is he feeling? He said, look, he said, 
bum bum. I said, look, Lord, he's after telling me this about him. What do you think? He says, I agree. He says, I don't know if he can get 36 tomorrow and then try to play the singles tomorrow. I said, okay, fine. So then I got on the radio and got his physio, his coach, who is as a trainer um, who was inside in the clubhouse, went into him, sat down with him and said, where, where are you at? At this stage now, it's 25 minutes before his tea time. And he said the same thing. So I had to make a call. And based on the three people who were closest to him, who would all give me the same information, um, I said, right, I'm going to take Henrik out this afternoon. I'm going to play this morning. So I went up to him and I said, Henrik, um, pull him aside. And I said, look, I said, Henrik, I'm making a last minute decision. I know we got you planned for paying 36 today, but I'm only going to take you for 18 today. Um, I think your back is a bit tight and I think you could do with the rest. You've played a lot of golf the last few months and I've just got a hunch that this is the best thing to do for you. I want you to give 100% this morning. Um, and then knowing that you're having a rest this afternoon before the singles. Are you okay with that? He said, yeah, fine, I'm okay with that. So then I had to go off and make a plan for who was going to come in in the afternoon, mm. um, which, which, which I did. Um, but more importantly, Henrik had 10 birdies that morning and won his game. Um, so, you know, that was the importance of the team that you have, whether it be at Man United or whether it be at the Ryder Cup. You're not just making all the decisions yourself. And everybody has to be rowing in behind you to give you the best information so that you can make your calls. Mm. Okay. Great. I have one last question, and that has to do with the media. You've both been the subject of intense media attention, sometimes good. Not and... me as much as him now. <laughs> Come on. Sometimes perhaps not so good. Um, <laughs> how do you deal with uh, the, the stresses of managing multiple stakeholders, you've got the media, you've got the fans, you've got the players all going on at once and at the same time you've got to maintain your own sense of well-being and you know staying on top of it yourself. How do you, how, how do you balance all that over, in your case Alex, over many, many years? Um, when I was a, arrived at United, of course I wasn't used to the, the sort of a volume of press and the interest from all over the world and this, what he was um, Work for Granada Television, Paul Docker, who just died recently. Um, he came to see me and says, look, I'm just going to give you a bit of advice. You're going into the press conference. That team weren't doing that great, the first team. He says, you're looking anxious. He says, you've got to get yourself sorted out. He says, wash your face or scrub your face. Make sure you're physically ready. It was a great bit of advice. Because you have to make it your press conference, not theirs. And what was happening with me was it was their press conference because I was trying to pacify them or play platitudes with them so that they'd be easy on me. It doesn't work that. <laughs> <laughs> so from that moment on, I made sure it was my press conference. So when I get these dodgy questions, I used to stare at them and delay my answer and get them nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's important to, to, to remember that. You think you're the weak one. They're the weaker one because they've got, they're going for a story. And I always knew which way they were going because I used to see them in the, 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 the car park all grouped together. And I could just, I could read it. And you ask the first question, I'll ask the second. <laughs> I knew when the first question came out where they were going. Right. And I made sure that they were going my way. Yeah. Really important, but anyone who goes in a press conference is really important to physically be ready because if you think about a football match, I'm going on television within, say, five, ten minutes of the game. Mm. And, you know, they ask that most stupid question. Well, what, what, you lose a game. What went wrong? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if, I knew, if I knew the solution to that, we wouldn't have lost. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It is. It's an interesting part because it's really important. My way to the life, mm. oh, no, the last 15 years I stopped going to press conferences after the game. You know why? There's only PA that's in there. It's only the press association. All the journals are in the, in the tunnel trying to get the players. Ah. So waste of time going to press conference after the game. The, mo the most important thing, and this is what you're talking about, fans and maybe stakeholders, the owners, when you're doing a press conference, add a message for the fans. Always a message for the fans in the sense of where we're going, uh, what our expectation was, because they are the most important people, the fans. And my job is to send them home happy. Or even if you lose a game, they say, well, you know, we run out of time, or the referee was hopeless, or 
<laughs> you know, the, there's always a reason why we lost. You know, mm -hmm. they're really important. Now, for instance, you know that people ask me this all the time, maybe it's late goals we scored, right? Now, the reason is that because I want to send them home happy, right? I gambled. I don't mm -hmm. care if we're going to lose 2 nothing. if we're down one nil, it doesn't matter. Three points that I've gone. So I would send up more. I'd always try to make sure I had more players in the pitch who are capable of scoring a goal and go for it. And on one occasion we played Wimbledon in the replay in the FA Cup, I played Schmeichel centre forward the last five minutes. <laughs> and Dennis Irwin on the halfway line against Fashioner, <laughs> who's six foot three, and Dennis Irwin's five foot eight. <laughs> but to me, you want to nil down the cup fight, a cup tie, you're out anyway. Mm. So the gamble is worth, and you know, the, you know the value you get? You score in the last minute. How many goals did we score in the last minute in my time? The last minute. 165 goals in the last, last minute. Wow. On the last 15 minutes, 500 goals, right? That's because we gambled. We are prepared to try and take the, the game two to other teams. And the value is, you come in at time up, the players are jumping top of each other, the staff are going crazy, directors are jumping in the showers, everything. <laughs> you can't believe the behaviour of people when you beat. And the fans, they can't wait till they get home to see their wives and tell them what, what the last minute go to the pub, whatever. Mm -hmm. That's what my job was, to send them home happy. You know, mm -hmm. and, the, and the value is, is, is incredible. Fantastic, thank you. And Paul? Yeah, yeah, again, it's something that we converse about when, 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 you know, over our liquid lunches on, on the nice uh, French wine that, that uh, we had. And that's the big thing I talk about from, from these conversations was um, controlling the press conference, controlling the, the message to, to, because the, the players are listening to what you're saying in the media. So your, 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 your words are, have to be uh, very carefully chosen. Um, and obviously when we were playing at home, um, talking to the crowd and getting a message out to the crowd was obviously very important as well. So. Um, Press conferences are a wonderful opportunity uh, when you are a leader in sport um, to be able to get strong messages out and take strong positions. Great. Thank you so much.